Hi everyone from sunny Mexico. I'm gonna open up with a song called uh, Wake Up.
you want to come out or are you going to stay there? I'm on? Okay. Thank you, Swala. I don't know if she's going to stay in her studio booth or not. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining in today. Uh, we're going to have a great session. I, I watched, uh, watched you all last night and uh, yeah, I was very touched by the candor and uh, openness and transparency yeah, that, that Andy and Kenneth shared and then yeah, all of you uh, opening up the ones that opened your hearts up and really shared what you shared. It was very touching because I feel like that's the key to awakening and if we're going to go into an experience of the dreamer of the dream, being the dreamer of the dream, we will have to be very transparent and we will have to be very trusting because we have to stop hiding, we can't, can't keep playing hide and seek uh, with our mind, you know. It's kind of like uh, this is like a giant game of hide and seek where you hide, hide your light, hide your Christ identity and bury it down deep in the unconscious and then you cover it over with darkness and clouds and shadows and then get distracted with a projected screen of images and think that everything is about the screen of images. Kind of like going to a movie theater, forget you're in the movie theater, forget you're in the chair and then all of a sudden you're so engaged in the screen and the, the characters on the screen and the actions that are taking place and your mind is just interpreting the movie and you're feeling all these emotions going on when you're just, you've forgotten that you're uh, sitting in a dark room and uh, you're watching a screen of images and so in order for us to really, truly have the experience of waking up from this dream, we have to come back to forgiveness. We have to come back to the dreamer of the dream perspective. And it was kind of interesting because I was praying this morning before the session and, and Jesus was saying, remember the lesson from yesterday, you know, my happiness and my function are one. My happiness and my function are one. Wow. My happiness must come through forgiveness, which is my function. Wow, that's amazing. And then I was reminded of the part in the Course where Jesus says, awareness of dreaming is the function of God's teachers. So I put those two together. My happiness and my function are one. The awareness of dreaming is the function of God's teachers. So it must be my happiness and my awareness of dreaming are the same. That if I can be a lucid dreamer, you, some of you have had lucid dreams, you know, where you're in the middle of a, a dream at night, maybe you're being chased by a dragon or there's fire coming on you or a big tsunami or a werewolf has come out of nowhere and then all of a sudden you seem to flip into this thing like Wow, I'm dreaming now. And suddenly the fear goes away from the werewolf perception and from the tsunami perception and, and all the, the fear is gone. The fire-breathing dragon is, is not so scary when you're aware that you're dreaming. Ha ha ha! It's almost like that takes all the, the strain out. Or some of you have, have probably had the experience where you're dreaming a nighttime dream and it, then you're having a nightmare and then you wake up and you're sweating, you know, your cloak, pajamas are wet, your bed is wet because you've been sweating in this horrific nightmare and then when you wake up, what's your first experience? There's a bit of relief. Oh, thank God. Thank God it was just a dream. So what would happen if you trained your mind so completely to forgive? You emptied your mind so completely of grievances and opinions and judgments and attack thoughts and all unkind thoughts. If you just totally, like imagine you had a giant vacuum, a Holy Spirit Jesus vacuum, and you, you just really vacuumed your mind out. I vacuum my mind, I, oh get the heart too, let's go down there in the heart and vacuum the heart, let's, let's get all the grievances out of there, you know, really good deep clean. 
Or imagine, let me use a, a dental analogy. You know, some of you, has anybody ever experienced a, a root canal? Has anybody gone to the dentist for a root canal? Some of you might not even know what, it doesn't sound good, does it? Root canal. <laughs> you, go, you go to the dentist, oh, I've got a filling. Oh, that doesn't sound too good. Uh, I've, I've got a cleaning. Okay, root canal, you know. <laughs> Root canal is when you have like an abscess, in dental terms, you have an infection or an abscess under the tooth, in the gum, under the tooth, and it's in the root. The root that, the, the nerve that's under the, the tooth. So you have this powerful enamel tooth and, and the dentist says, oh, we've, you've got an abscess, uh, you've got a you've got a, a disease going on in, right by the nerve underneath the tooth. And so what do you have to do for a root canal is you have to have the dentist like drill down through the hard enamel and get down close to where that root, where that nerve is, and then you have to inject the peroxide and the, the things that are going to help heal that. Well. Similarly, when we're talking about healing your mind, we're talking about exposing the unconscious. And it was so beautiful watching all of you really getting in touch, maybe for the first time, at the depth of the anger that you feel underneath. I think that was one of the main themes I saw last night, was there was a lot of getting in touch with and even sometimes starting to express anger that's down there. Now, some of you know that uh, religions a lot of times tell you, you know, behave, be a good boy, be a good girl, good man, good woman. Here's the do's. If you do the, if you do the right things, you'll please God and you'll go to heaven. And if you do the wrong things, uh, you're in trouble. You'll burn in hell. Uh, that's what a lot of religions teach. But I think one of the things that was missing in a lot of religions was just this awareness of the unconscious mind. You know, we can say, we start to look at, at Sigmund Freud comes along and he starts talking about the unconscious mind. And we cannot leave the unconscious mind out of our discussion. I was so glad, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Price, you brought up, you know, your situation where you had this anger. You know, you grow up in a Christian community, you're trying to be the best that you can, you're trying to do the best that you can, but you start at some point to have these teachings, you know, you know, if, you, if you're angry, then that's a sin against God, so you're a little concerned about that, and then you've got some other feelings going on in there, and then you start to feel maybe, oh, maybe I'm gay, oh, that's tough. In a Christian community, uh, you're coming out as gay, and then you feel you have to leave, uh, because it's too intense, and then you feel ostracized, rejected, and so on and so forth. So that's great that you're in touch with all that, because I want to go into those kind of things today, and I want to go into the unconscious mind, because there's, there must be something operating at that unconscious level that would project out an interpretation like that, a story where you feel rejected, ostracized, you feel you feel abandoned, you know, you feel all those feelings, but there must be something going on much deeper. What lies beneath that we have to get at if we're going to release this anger and release these interpretations, these uh, crazy ego interpretations. So Freud talked about the unconscious mind, and then there was, there was those that neo-Freudians and ones that came after it. Uh, some of you are aware of like Carl Jung, uh, Carl Jung talked about the unconscious mind as like the shadow. And basically he said, listen, the only way you're going to escape from the shadow is you have to look at it. Uh, you can't hide it, and you can't run from it, you can't deny it, you can't try to avoid it. Uh, you know, you're going to have to look at your darkness, uh, and you're going to have to learn to, to see it in a different way and to release it, because you're not just going to do like, like Kenneth was saying, you can't just throw pink paint all over the world. Maybe the Pink Panther, the opening of the Pink Panther movies, yeah, the Pink Panther was putting pink paint over everything, but in the end, the pink paint 
approach of just affirming how sweet and lovely and beautiful everything is, it doesn't really help you if you're still sitting on a keg of dynamite, which I'm going to call the unconscious mind. It's interesting, after Freud and, and after Carl Jung, we have Jesus now. We'll say Jesus is like the master psychologist. He's like the master metaphysician. He's the master philosopher. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Why do I even call him all these wonderful superlatives except that he transcended time and space and said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He overcame the devil, which is, is the belief in separation. It's not like an entity, it's just a belief. But he, he transcended the belief in the error of separation, that we could separate from God. Hallelujah! But now we have the Master, the Master who is going to work with us today and is going to come amongst us and is going to start to help us clear away all these blocks to the awareness of dreaming. And one of the things I would have to say that really touched me when I was watching last night was I was listening to Kenneth and and Andy talk, and, and we were starting to get into the dreamer of the dream idea. And what really dawned on me, Jesus was like giving me all kinds of downloads, downloads last night, this morning, downloads, downloads, was that um, the dreaming has to be looked at really closely because when we say dreamer of the dream, Jesus says, you are the dreamer of the world of dreams. No other cause does it have or ever will. But let's just look at that phrase for a moment. You are the dreamer of the dream. You notice it's not plural. He just says, you are the dreamer. That's singular, right? Dreamer, no S. You are the dreamer of what? The dream. He doesn't say you are the dreamer of dreams. You have to watch very carefully what Jesus says. He says, you are the dreamer of the dream. One dreamer, one dream. That's important. And the reason it's important is because it's singular. And if you're going to reach back and remember God, which is remembering eternity, or remembering the infinite, remembering the changeless, remembering perfection, divine love. If you're going to remember oneness, don't you think that the correction in your mind would, would be a reflection of that oneness in terms of the dream? So what he's telling us is, listen, there's only one mind, and there's only one dreamer, and there's only one dream. Because a lot of times when I would travel around the world, 44 countries, I'd do all these meetings, conferences, workshops, course groups, and people would come up to me and they would say, am I in your dream or are you in my dream? Oh, no, no. No, no, that's not a good question. Because the question implies that there's more than one dream. That's very confusing. There's even a, a Star Trek show, Star Trek Voyager episode, you know, how, how, you love it, how in Star Trek the crew goes out, and this is Star Trek Voyager, so the whole crew, Janeway and Jacote, and they're all out there, and you know, they come across, you know, the Klingons, the Romulans, the Borg, they come across all these different uh, species, you know, and all these different civilizations and so forth, but one time they're out, and they, the they're just going along, cruising along in their, in their spaceship, you know, having a good time in there. And Janeway's doing the captain thing, and Jacote, all of them. And then all of a sudden, one by one, all of the crew start falling asleep. And they all start falling asleep. And they can't figure out what he's doing, but until finally Jacote, you know, he's, he's kind of a native, he's got all these tribal things, and He's doing some of his ancient practices, and he's starting to, to uh, go in to figure out what is happening, because that's the problem. The, it doesn't seem like they're being attacked by a species or a, a planet or a race, but it's like they're all being put to sleep. And then, as they go deeper, 
uh, the crew seems to disappear and they seem to show up on another ship and they're all having this discussion and one of the characters on the, the ship says basically, what if we're all just dream characters and we're all just being dreamed up by some other character? Kind of like Manuela down there in Peru, you were saying, what if there's a giant, what if we're all just these giants? What if there's a giant mind and, and all these characters are just being dreamed up by this giant mind and they're not really real? Oops, what if they're, if they all disappear, what will happen? But the characters in the Star Trek episodes start talking and saying, what if we're all just figures in somebody else's dream? The characters are saying, and then Balana says, oh no, I'm real. <laughs> I'm real. <laughs> That's interesting when the characters say, oh, I'm real. I'm, I, I can assure you that. I'm real. Let me just tell you this. And it reminds me of a Demi Moore movie uh, called Passion of Mind where she seems to be in France and she seems to have these two little girls and, she, and a mother and she has a boyfriend and she's got this life in rural France. And then when she goes to sleep at night, she, she has another life. She's, she's like a, a businesswoman in New York City. I don't know if any of you have seen this. It's in my movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. She goes to sleep. She's a mother in France with two little girls. She goes to sleep. She's a powerful businesswoman in New York City. She goes to sleep. She's got a boyfriend in France. She's got a boyfriend in New York City. She's got a therapist, a Freudian therapist in France. She's got a, a therapist in New York City. And she keeps going to therapy saying, I got a split life going on. I've got two lives going on. And the Freudian therapist is like, yeah, that's a problem. Your New York life is a fantasy. And so is that other therapist over there in New York. And guess what the New York therapist is doing? He's saying, no, your France life is, is the delusion. That's the fantasy. Uh, he says, we need to dispel that therapist over there in France. <laughs> you, see, you see what's happening? If you've got multiple dreams going on, who are you going to trust? Or like the Ghostbusters say, who, who are you going to call? If you've got multiple dreams going on, Let's say you think you've got a daily life going on. Jesus says those are dreams. And then you have a nighttime life generated. We'll call them nighttime dreams. Jesus says, no, no, you don't have two different kinds of dreams. He never says daydreams and night dreams. He says all your time is spent in dreaming. You are, you are dreaming one dream. And you're dreaming that you sleep at night and you have nighttime dreams. You're dreaming you have a daily life. You are, the ego has generated a, an unreal world and you are so caught up in this dream, but you think you're a figure inside the dream. And as long as you identify with the figure, you are not aware that you're dreaming. You are caught in the ego's delusions of false self. We were talking yesterday too, uh, Danielle, you brought up that you, know, you had that long call from your dad and he told you that big long story, Danielle, and he was, it was cute. He was saying, wow, it's a big story and, and, and you were like and listening and wow, this is a pretty interesting story. And then the very end, the, the main character realizes it's all a dream. And your first reaction was a little bit of disappointment like, Oh yeah, that was the Wizard of Oz thing again, you know, it's like, if you're a writer, if you're identified as a writer, you want to sell the book, you want to sell the screenplay, you want to sell it to a studio or to some big company to make some money, and then Dad, has, the end of his thing is, oh yeah, and then she wakes up and she, she sees it was all a dream. You're thinking, nah, it's been done before. It was a good story and then you had to have that kind of an ending. But actually, that was a great symbol. Your dad telling you that right before you came on was a beautiful symbol that your mind is ready to take a look at, at a closer way at this dreaming idea. And how beautiful, what a beautiful symbol that your dad called you that way. And then when, we, when you mentioned The Wizard of Oz, of course, at the end of The Wizard of Oz, we all know the story that Dorothy does wake up because she... Glenda, the good witch, tells her, Oh, Dorothy, you always had the power in your mind to go home. All you have to do is click your ruby slippers together three times and just say, There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. 
But in The Wizard of Oz, she does that and she goes back where? To Can Kansas. And there's Aunt M, and there's her uncle, and there's Toto, her dog, and so her dream of, of the Wizard of Oz and of Oz was, had all the same characters, but they were transplanted from her home in Kansas. Well, what I'm going to tell you now, everybody pay attention, is dream characters don't wake up. That, you, you will never find a dream character that wakes up because the definition of being asleep is that there are dream characters, or that there ever were. You see, the ego generated them, and so if the ego generated, whatever the ego generates, which is the dream characters, they don't wake up. They're just figures, they're just images that are projected onto a screen, and the only thing that awakens is the mind. So, don't go worrying whether Siddhartha or Buddha woke up, and don't go worrying whether Jesus woke up, and don't worry whether Ramana Maharshi died of, uh, of cancer with, a, with some kind of a, a, a legion and, and all this. Don't, don't even go there. And don't even ask me, is, is David awake? Listen, please, stop this. Stop this foolish uh, talk of thinking that dream characters wake up. They're projections of the ego to keep your mind from waking up. And as long as you keep asking these questions, why did Ken Wapnick die of cancer? Oh, come on! Would you stop asking questions about these dream characters and ask the questions about your mind, which is where your beliefs are, your thoughts are, that's where your feelings are. You may say, well, my body has a lot of feelings. No, it doesn't. Jesus tells us in the Course, the body doesn't feel. You, your mind projects the feelings onto the body. Just like when you go watch a movie at the movie theater, you may, you may perceive that, uh, you know, when Deborah Winger dies at the end of, of a movie, or Julia Roberts dies, or, or whoever dies, that, that it's, a, it's a sad thing. No, it's, it's an unreal thing. The, the characters are just symbols. And you're not really asking a question when you're asking about, did a symbol wake up? What do you mean, did a symbol wake up? What does that even mean? Did a symbol die? Did a, was a symbol enlightened? Don't ask me if these characters throughout history, Buddha, Jesus, Ramana, and everything, don't stop asking the question whether these characters were awake or not. Because the very idea that you believe in these characters is the definition of sleep. So there's only one mind, and there's only one dream, and your only responsibility is to be happy and joyful and realize you are the dreamer of the dream. And no other cause does it have. You don't have to worry about the Big Bang because, you know, you're the dreamer of the dream. You don't have to look in time and space and history to see how did the cosmos form and all these Newtonian scientific questions and how did this happen? How did that happen? What about this era? What about that era? What, what about these politics or those politics? It's all fragmented perception and until you have the recognition that the problem is the fragmented perception coming from the fragmented consciousness. That's where these multiple dreams seem to come in, these multiple dream figures. For example, let's take a topic like learning. You know, it seems in the, in the dream that my mother was a teacher. And it's a funny idea to me now, because people don't learn. People are images. It's the mind that has learned this world. It's the mind that learned this ego and never stopped to pause over learning a completely delusional thought system. And the people are just the projections. But when you say, well, wait a minute, what, don't children learn? No, children don't learn. They're projections. Don't, don't adults learn? No. To believe that, that bodies or persons that have brains and to believe in human development or human evolution. Somebody asked me that several weeks ago. They were talking about, doesn't Jesus believe in evolution? No. 
Jesus does not believe in evolution. If it's all simultaneous, how could Jesus be teaching us about evolution? You know, time is the trick. The whole thing is a trick to keep you from knowing who you are. So let me go deeper into this question. This, you are the dreamer of the dream. Singular. There's one dreamer, there's one dream. The ego made up a trick to keep you from experiencing the simplicity of salvation. And, and Jesus talks about this pretty late in the text. Jesus says, according to this ego dream, there's two parts. You notice two is not one. The ego made a two-parted dream to keep you from knowing you're the dreamer of the dream. And Jesus goes on. He goes way beyond Freud, way beyond Carl Jung. He goes on to tell you exactly about this trick that's happening in the mind to keep you asleep. He says that there's two parts to this self-concept. There's a surface part, which is the face of innocence, and then there's this dark, unconscious part of, of the dream, and he calls the surface part the face of innocence, and he calls the bottom part, he calls the dream that you dream in secret. So there's the word secret. Everything in the unconscious mind is pushed out of awareness. All that darkness, all that anger, all that hurt, all that rage, you know, it may pop up into awareness from time to time as you're discovering, but it's in the unconscious mind. So, he says it's two parts. The dream that you gave away. He's talking about the one that you perceive like where there's David on a screen now, and, you, and there's other people in the world, and there's plants, and there's animals, and there's mountains and trees, and cats and dogs, and and, and galaxies, and stars, and planets, and so forth. That's the dream that you gave away. The projected world that you seem to see every day is the dream that you gave away. That's what Jesus calls it, the dream that you gave away. And then what's going on? Where is this dream that was given away? Where is it, where is it happening? Where did it start? He says that's the dream that you dream in secret. You dream in secret that you separated from God. Why would you keep a secret like that? Because it's so horrific. The belief that you could separate your mind from the Creator is so horrifying, is so dark, that he uses the phrase draped with sin. When Jesus calls something draped with sin, it gets my attention. <laughs> He's talking darker than dark. And that's the unconscious mind. That's the part that's pushed out of awareness. He also tells us that there's something deeper than that. Like if you, you know, some of you have read The Ob Obstacles to Peace, and you go down through The Obstacles to Peace, there's four obstacles, and the fourth obstacle, way down in the mind that, that uh, Kenneth talked about last night, he said, you made a bargain. You made a bargain with, with the ego, a bargain with the devil that you swore that you would never look upon. And that is the fear of God's love. It's almost like you sealed the dream, and it was a, with, sealed the darkness by making a pact with the devil, swearing that you would never go down and, and look at that, that premise that you could actually separate from God. Because what Jesus is saying is, it's almost like a hatch at the bottom of a submarine, and you've got to go down, and you're supposed to, you swore to the ego you would never, but you're going to do it. You're going to open the hatch, and look down there, and Jesus is saying there's nothing but light and love under that hatch. God doesn't hate you at all. God is not angry. God is, would never punish you. God is pure love. There's nothing but light if you go down to that fourth obstacle, fear of God's love, and you go through that hatch. You'll, just, you'll spring into heaven if you go through that hatch. But the ego doesn't even want you to come close to that master switch doesn't want you to come close to that release point. Because if you open that hatch, and it's all light, guess what? There's no ego. <laughs> Perfect love cast out fear. If you open that hatch that you swore never to open with, to the ego, you're just going to find out that there's only light. So we have the projected world, we have the dream that you dream in secret, 
which is the unconscious mind, or what Jesus calls the unwatched mind. It's not watched at all, it's just underneath, dark. And then you have pure love and light of the kingdom of heaven that's, that's even further deeper than that, that darkness. Now, a lot of you were talking about a lot of, of anger, rage, hatred that's coming up. Here's a line from Jesus that will help you right away. And, and this is important because he says, until you are willing to look upon the full extent of your own self-hatred, you will not be willing to let it go. That's an important line. That's a very important line. You know, he tells us in the Course you have to go through the darkness to the light. He's saying, until you're willing to look upon the full extent of your own self-hatred, which is what the ego is, until you're willing to look upon the full extent of your belief in the ego, I mean root canal, all the way down to the very core, right down to the hatch, until you're willing to look at the full extent of your own self-hatred, you will not be willing to let it go. As long as you have an unconscious mind, as long as there's something you haven't raised up into awareness that Kenneth and Andy were talking about last night, then you're sitting on darkness. And you can try to put pink paint, paint like Ken said, you can try to la 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 la, I'm going to dress it up and make a pretty world and, and have a happy dream and happy dream and oh, I'm going on a cruise, I'm going to have a happy dream and Oh yeah, well some of the people cruising over in Asia, the, their happy dream kind of crashed down a little bit. Or, you know, oh I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a house in the country and I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to build a house, you know, like uh, Andreas and Malou. You know, Andreas is out every day, he's building this house and, and he's, ah! He's not happy. Malou's got the kids and he's out there sawing and hammering, doing everything. And it's going to take a hundred years to build this damn house. And, and he's out there raging and Malou's inside raging in, in her own mind. And, and they're, how do we get out of this little rage uh, thing that's going on? Well, it's going to be the dreamer of the dream. It, it's going to be coming back in your mind and, and exposing and releasing every scrap of unconscious belief that Kenneth and, and Andy were talking about. Does that seem like a big job? Who cares if it's big or small? If it's blocking you from the Kingdom of Heaven, if it's blocking you from happiness, aren't you ready to go after, you know, to go in there? Like Jesus is like saying, I've got the light, let's go in there together. I'll, I'll shine that ego away from you if you'll just come on this inner journey with me. It's the most important thing you will ever do. I had Philippe Soul from New York, he, he wrote a beautiful question in. This is one of the newer questions that just came in. And he said, I just, Philippe, we love you so much. Hello, mighty companions. I was wondering if you could share with us a glimpse, an experience, a taste of how someone could start to deeply believe, feel that we are the dreamer of the dream. To reach the point of having no opinion on any matters of the dream, to rise above the battlefield, being guided by spirit towards that final perception of the world. I feel that this is not an experience that can be intellectual trained, but must be coming from some kind of remembering, abstract, undercurrent, mystical moment. Or is this a false belief my ego is trying to make? It looks seemingly difficult to experience and less easy to believe. Thank you so much for all your beautiful work. We are the lights of the world and your community is shining its light so brightly. Merci! Merci, Philippe! Now, Philippe, you're getting to the core of things here. You notice Philippe has noticed that an intellectual experience, an intellectual memorization of the Course, an intellectual memorization of all the Course of Miracles principles, he's onto it. Philippe, you're onto it. That, that well, your cat's onto it too. Uh, he's, he's very loving. 
uh, Philippe and his cat are onto it, they know that this is not something where you just start to memorize a bunch of theories and, and concepts and you come up with a new theology, oh, God is love, and you know, you do the Hare Krishna dance and a few things here and there, but you know, you're not going to find it through the intellect. And what I mean by that is you won't find it through the manipulation of, of metaphysical concepts. This is what the theologians get stuck in. These are what the scholars, you know, Jesus was not really a fan of the scholars. <laughs> he said, it's here, it's living, uh, and it's, it's at hand, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But he didn't, he wasn't really a fan of like scholars and, and a lot of theology and rules and, and history. He wasn't even a big fan of history, you know. He took the Ten Commandments and he, he shrunk them down to two out of ten. He was a minimalist. <laughs> He was like, hey, listen, 10, okay, let's just try to live and practice the first two, and I'll work with you on just living the first two commandments, and you'll be happy. Now, if God is pure happiness, and there's experiences of anger, then there must be something that's believed in that's not of God. Because God is not the creator of anger. God doesn't create guilt. God doesn't create pain and shame. God doesn't create duality, fast and slow, hot and cold, good and bad, male and female, masculine, feminine. All these concepts are just ego constructs to keep you from knowing the truth of who you are as the one in the, in the matrix, the one. But I like Philippe's question because he's like saying, he, you ask if you could share with us a glimpse, an experience, a taste, of how someone could start to deeply believe, feel that we are the dreamer of the dream. So you're asking the how question. You know, this is a common question. Show me just the tiniest glimpse of the how. And what I'm going to tell you is, from my experience, you have to dive in and trust. Like if I roll the script back to David, when David's like 28 years old, now, the dream character is called in the world 62, but let's roll it back to the David at 28, where the course lands in David's lap. David opens the book, and it's just the beginning, okay? It's just the beginning. The words are just the beginning. It can't be that we reach the kingdom of heaven through words. Otherwise, the scholars would be there already. <laughs> they, they would. The, the scholars, the scholars, the theologians would be in heaven. They wouldn't be arguing with each other about God or about science or about anything, really. They would just be, be one. But what is it, when I opened that book, was came an experience when I'm looking at the Course, I'm reading the ideas, and then at some point I was saying the same words that uh, Andreas was saying last night at the end, Oh Lord, Lord! I was like, but mine was like, Lord, oh Lord, take me, oh Lord, you take my life. If I had any future ambitions at, when I was, seemed to be 28, you know, career ambitions, where I want to live, what I want to do with my life, life partner ambitions, uh, to have a kitty cat, and you know, whatever it was, you know, any ambitions, oh Lord, take my life. Oh Lord, let me listen to you. Show the way. I will but follow. This is my mind speaking. <laughs> this really wasn't, this was, wasn't a, a personality. This is my heart praying, saying, Take my life, lead me, guide me, show the way. I have, I, whatever I have, I don't have much in my bank account, Jesus, but you know, I trust you can handle that too. Uh, I don't have many worldly possessions, but whatever I've got, here it is. So I seem to experience a body, yep, take that. Take my 10 years of university learning, well, I'll take all my learning in time and space for the last 28 years, or however longer I've been learning this crazy dream. Take it, take it, take it. That's what Kenneth and Andy were saying last night. Take it, 
take it. Expose it, take it. So I had a moment, an epiphany, a glimpse, a glorious moment where I just was like, I'm going to go for this. I'm all in. I'm going to go for broke. I'm not going to hold back and try to keep a few think, tink, tinker toys here when enlightenment, when salvation is offered to me by Jesus Christ, I'm going to say, yes, I'm all in. And what that means really is listen and follow. And of course, the ego was not happy at all with that moment, yes, I'm all in. But it was even more upset after that moment <laughs> because, because uh, Jesus is like, I want to speak through you. What? The ego is like, no, David doesn't, he's, he doesn't speak. You know, he, he, he's not a speaker. Jesus is like, I want to speak through you. I will move that puppet, I will travel that puppet around the world. No, David's not a traveler. Yeah, well, not, uh, Jesus is in charge, he pulls the strings, and that puppet's in 44 countries and around and around the world, speaking, 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 groups and living rooms, backyards, picnics, barbecues, conferences, workshops. For the last, like, 30, some 30 years, Jesus is like, oh, you want me to use you, use your mind? Glad you asked. <laughs> you know, in the Bible, Jesus has in his red letters in the Bible, you know, to those who are called, much will be asked or much will be required. You know, I never had a clue what that meant. You know, much will be required, much will be called, only your entire life of miracles <laughs> to take you back to salvation. That's what it takes. So you don't, it's not like Jesus is saying, you know, just keep your personality life, keep your beliefs, keep your concepts and everything. He's saying, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expose and, and bring to the surface all of the darkness. You're going to, your face will seem wet with tears uh, on the top level. Your, your body is going to cry, it's going to go through some wailing and maybe gnashing of teeth and all that stuff they talked about in the Bible. Yeah, you'll go through all that seemingly just to come back to the light. But your question is good because you're saying, what is it really going to take? Let, give it to me straight. And all I'm saying is, if you make a commitment to be transparent, like Andy and Kent were talking about, to not hide anything, to not try to keep things down, you know, to not try to hold on to anything. But if you really say, take my heart, clear my mind, and you really mean it, it's like a prayer of your heart, then you will also be willing to accept whatever seems to happen in the dream world. And, and that's what I was willing to do. That's the big key right there. Oh, you're going on a trip. A trip? How long? You'll find out. I'll find out. Where is this trip? Well, start traveling. We're starting across the United States. The United States? How are we going to travel without money? Jesus, where, where are you coming from? Where do you live? You can't go traveling across the United States without money. Are you crazy? Are you going to give me a credit card or... Something. <laughs> it's like, oh, I will provide for you day by day, moment by moment, if you stay with me. There's a part in A Course in Miracles, it's called The Promise. Oh, it's a great, you know, in the Bible it was just all in the red letters. Look at the lilies of the field. They neither spin nor toil, and yet they are provided for more than then Solomon, they're clothed more beautifully than Solomon, the lilies of the field. So, what does he say in A Course in Miracles? Once you accept the plan, once you accept that plan, once you've accepted his plan, the Holy Spirit's plan, is the one function you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you without your effort. Oh my God! Without my effort! Are you telling me if I say yes to you that you're going to arrange everything of time and space without my effort? You're going to give me an effortless life? That's right, he says. 
Without your effort, he will go before you, making straight your path and leaving in your way no stones to trip on, no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied you. Nothing I need will be denied me if I need food. Yep, you'll get it. Money? Yep. Clothing? Yep. Transportation? Yep. A nice warm kitty cat on my lap? Yep. If that helps, you'll have the kitty cat on your lap. It's a little chilly, nice little long sleeve sweater there in New York. Yes, you get the sweater. Nothing you need will be denied you. Not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. You need take thought for nothing except the only purpose you would fulfill. There it is. He, he said, if you'll just serve my purpose, I'll handle everything of time and space, and you won't even have to put an effort into it. It's like, he's like saying, sound like a pretty good deal? I'm like, hmm. It sounds a little unbelievable, and he's like, believe me, believe me, it's true. So, for some of you who are wondering, why am I still studying the Course? I, I had a friend who just wrote to me, who, Margaret, who, who, uh, who was studying the Course uh, for 30 years, and she just wrote to me, uh, and she just said, I'm listening to your lessons, your, the reading of the lessons you're doing, and, and text uh, on uh, Spreaker and YouTube, and your commentary, and she said, just to let you know, I, I'm getting it for the first time, and I've been studying the Course for 30 years. Oh, I, that's music to my ears, I'm getting it for the first time after 30 years of study. Because there's a mind meld happening, there's a merge. She's starting to zoom inward, truly, to the dreamer of the dream. And she's feeling it. And Margaret's writing to me to tell, tell me that. So, I thought I would talk a bit. I thought, with our group, what's the most practical way that we can go into the dreamer of the dream? And last night, the same theme was repeated over and over. Anger, 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 anger. So I thought, what, what can we do? Jesus, you and I, what can we do today for all our brothers and sisters here? And, and Jesus said, well, why don't we just dismantle and demystify anger? Because if, if it's starting to pop up in a lot of your experiences, and you know, like Jason, you know, you're starting to feel like, oh, I'm angry at my dad. For, I'm wondering, how could I have bottled up this anger for so long? You know, my mother's bulimic, and my mother's an alcoholic, and my dad, he's going to work, and, and I'm there, and, he, and my God, I am starting to get angry. For the first time in my life, I'm tapping into this wellspring of anger because of, of that. And what Jesus is saying is like, well, the anger's coming up. Yeah, that's good. It's good. It's, it's better up where we can heal it than, than denied. Because when it's denied, we don't have, you know, it can't be healed. It's just pushed out of awareness. But when it's brought up to the light, that's how it heals. But also Jesus is, was telling me this morning in the download, he's saying with Jason, he's saying, what if you just tell Jason that your mom did the best that she could do based on what she believed in her mind? It's a stepping stone idea, but Jesus asked me to tell you this. And your dad, going to work and saying, she never talked about it, your dad did the best he could do based on what he believed. He was just doing the best he could do based on his belief system. And then you, little Jason, who was there too in the scene, you did the best that you could do at that time based on what you believed. Everybody's always doing the best that they can do, but there's this secret dream underneath. He calls the dream you dream in secret, the unconscious mind. That's where the darkness is. And all of these surface characters and those scenarios you're remembering, Jesus is saying, yeah, you have an interpretation and it's extremely, is bringing up a lot of anger, that interpretation. And he wants to help ease your mind and ease your pain by saying, just think of it this way, everybody did the best that they could do. And now you're doing it for yourself and for your mother and for your dad. You're going for the escape hatch. You're saying, here, here you go, Mom, this one's for you. 
I'm on this retreat and I'm with Jesus and I'm going down for the escape hatch. I'm going to solve this and I'm going to be healed and I'm going to heal the whole universe with me. Mom, dad, yep, everybody. My, my little Jason memories, I'm going, I'm going to heal the whole thing. And that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to, since you brought it up, Jason, and a number of you, Kenneth, and a lot of you, Andy, a lot of you brought up the anger. What does Jesus Christ have to tell us about anger? Wouldn't that be nice to know? Wouldn't it be great to dismantle this before we get swept away <laughs> by the rage <laughs> that could come? Well, here's what Jesus had to say. Jesus said, yeah, you might want to go back, David, to chapter 6, and uh, I've got a few interesting things to say about anger. Because if we can start to understand anger, and we can start to realize that there's something going on down deep in our mind that's producing the anger. It's really the ego's anger. It's not ours. God's not angry. It must be the ego's anger. We must be identified with the ego. We must be feeling its emotions if we're so angry. So maybe Jesus can help us dismantle this whole thing. Here's what he says about anger. Jesus says, anger cannot occur. Isn't that a good start? What a start! The first sentence! Anger cannot occur unless you believe that you have been attacked, that your attack is justified in return, and that you are in no way responsible for it. Oh my gosh! He's telling us we have three beliefs that are in our unconscious mind, and anger can't even occur unless we believe these three things. And he, goes, he gives us the service of telling us what they are. I'll say it again. Anger cannot occur unless you believe that you have been attacked, that your attack is justified in return, and that you are in no way responsible for it. Okay. Now, I think everybody there probably is nodding their heads like, All right, you got me, Jesus. <laughs> you got me on those three. Because he's saying, if you don't believe in these three things, you could never even feel anger. So, so now we've got to be honest. Now we've got to start to take a look at these three things. Again, I'll repeat them. Anger cannot occur unless you believe that you have been attacked, that your attack is justified in return, and that you are in no way responsible for it. Here's what he says. Given these three wholly irrational premises, irrational, the equally irrational conclusion that a brother is worthy of attack rather than love must follow. So basically he's saying is, if you're going to continue to hold on to these three irrational unconscious premises, then you're going to have times, you're going to project this irrationality, this angry hatred and insanity, you're going to project this onto the dream characters. Whether it's the body you think you are or other bodies, it doesn't matter. You're going to project it to time and space. You're going to project the error of these three irrational premises onto the world. And Jesus has already told us in the Course, He says, you are not responsible for the error. You are responsible for accepting the correction for the error. And he even goes further to tell us, oh, maybe I should repeat that because these are so good, I don't want you to miss it. I'll say it one more time. You are not responsible for the error. You're not, you, are a child of God, are not responsible for the ego. You, the Christ, are not responsible for the error, but you are responsible for accepting the correction for the error. That's what miracles are. That's what forgiveness is all about. That's the correction, the atonement, forgiveness. So you're not responsible for the error, but you're responsible for accepting the correction. And then he helps us even more. He says, do not project the error to time, to time and space. What does that last part mean? Do not project the error. Don't project this tiny little belief, this crazy t tiny mad idea in your mind. Don't project it to time. Don't blame your father, your mother, your sister, your brother. Don't blame your boss. Don't blame the president. Don't blame the society. Don't blame your neighbor. Don't blame your dog, your cat. Don't blame the weather. 
don't blame anything of time and space if you're feeling upset. If you're feeling angry and mad, don't project the error to time and space. Give it to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit looks not to effects. All those things I just mentioned are effects. And the Holy Spirit looks not to effects. The Holy Spirit has already judged the cause. The ego is unreal, so he looks not to effects. And that's why you have to bring all your small upsets, all your irritations, your annoyances, your anger, your guilt, your, your fatigue, your any struggles you have. You have to keep get into the good practice, like Kenneth and Andy were talking about, get into the good practice of exposing it and handing it over to the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to continue with this uh, quote that I was reading earlier. What can be expected from insane premises except an insane conclusion? So if you have unconscious insane premises, these are false beliefs, false assumptions about the nature of reality, the nature of, of everything. If you have false insane premises, what can be expected except an insane conclusion? In other words, you, you will experience anger and guilt and pain and shame and all these dark emotions, egoic emotions, if you continue to hold on to insane premises. You'll make an insane conclusion. And what is that insane conclusion but that's attack? You know, Kenneth mentioned last night that really the whole point of all this mind training is to get to a point where you realize that attack is impossible. Because to have attack you'd have to have duality, an attacker and an attacky. Mind is one, spirit is one, God is one, love is one. There's only one dreamer. Where's, where are we going to get attack if we only have one? And believe me, I'll tell you, that one is spirit, and spirit doesn't attack itself. That's really sick if you think God is attacking God, or, or spirit attacks spirit, or, or Christ attacks God. Why would happiness attack happiness? That's ridiculous. So. This insane group of premises is all coming so that there'll be a conclusion, and that is, I've been attacked. And basically, for everyone who expressed some anger coming up, in, in, including Jason, like you were, you were starting to feel anger, anger at your dad, like, Dad, Dad, why didn't you intervene? Come on, I was a child, Dad, please. And what's your excuse? I had to work. You, you know, that's the conclusion you're making. That's where the anger is coming up like, Dad, you failed me. My God, you failed miserably. And, and that's the conclusion. Based on these three insane premises, you're concluding, Dad did not do a very good job. Mom wasn't so hot either. <laughs> And, and poor Jason, how, how the hell do you expect Jason to grow up to be a happy human being with parents like that? Listen, Jason, you're not alone. There's a few people <laughs> go to Al-Anon, dysfunctional families, 12 steps for 20, 50 years talking about the same thing. My parents done me wrong. My society done me wrong. Why was I born in this culture at this time? God, how dare you send me down here? <laughs> I'll get you. If I ever get back to heaven, you're going to pay the price for sending me here. No, God didn't send anybody. This is the ego's invention. This isn't God's doing at all. I have done this thing and it is this I would undo. So, a good way to start to get out of it, Jason, is I, this is what, when I started to get years ago, I was so angry at my mother and so angry at my father. And that stayed on for years. I was angry at them for years and years and years. And I asked Jesus one time, I said, I am pissed off. I am so mad at, at the way that I was raised and the way they treated me. And Jesus said, well, let's see, before you came to this world, you, you believed in the ego before you even seemed to get here. And I was like, I did? He's like, yeah, oh yeah. Don't think that they, they put this on you. You believed in separation before you even seemed to fool yourself that you were a figure in time and space. You believed in it before. And then, 
When you came, you brought all that baggage with you and you handed out, the ego handed out the parts. Mom, okay, you're going to be bulimic this lifetime and, and uh, they may be crazy. <laughs> you, you play the crazy one uh, this time. Alcoholic, you know, I'm, okay, ego, dad, you just, you're the absentee, you'll be the absentee dad in this life. You know, you're at work all the time. And the ego passed out the parts and then we believe it, you know, we, we set it up, we, before we even got here, we, we did the Shakespeare thing, you know, we did our Shakespeare drama, ego drama in our mind, we passed, ego passed out all the parts, and then uh, we were so upset, so upset, it's such a disappointing lifetime, and Jesus is like, well, you did it to yourself, so I don't know why you're so upset, you know, but I'll, I'll tell you, you got three things here that you believe in, that are part of this thing. And if you understand that these are crazy, you're never coming back to time and space again. <laughs> you're, you're just going to be in heaven laughing and enjoy with God for eternity if you decide to question these three false premises, that is. Or you can come back and keep reincarnating and trying to blame, play the blame game for as many centuries as you want. Yeah, you can go on for thousands of years if you want. But, you're just doing it to yourself, so I'm going to tell you the three things. Unplug your mind from these three things, and you're home free. You, you, in fact, you never left. You, you won't even have any war stories left to tell in heaven when you get these three. This is it's pure love and light from here on. Now, here's the best part. He says, the way, this is where Philippe was asking me how. That's the question, how? David, can you tell me how? Here he says, the way to undo an insane conclusion is to consider the sanity of the premises on which it rests. Those three things that I, I spoke over and over, if you just are willing to consider the sanity of these things, then you will be able to be free. Now, how do you consider the sanity of, of false beliefs? Well, I always found that Whatever you is, just say, say what it is, and then right after you're done saying it, say, saith the Lord. So just put saith the Lord after the thought. Let's go back to Kenneth, Kenneth Price. You know, you have a lot of angry, anger at Christianity. You have a lot of anger at, at that community, that Christian community, that did not accept that you were gay, that did not accept you for who you truly are. They're supposed to be Christians, for Christ's sake! They're supposed to be loving! And, oh man, that Christian, that gold old time, bear the cross Christian religion, you know. So there's a grievance there against uh, Christianity, we'll say. And there's a grievance against the family. There's a grievance against the community. It's been in there. It's like, ah, it's like a monster. It's raging in there. And so, let's just try that on, you know, it's like, um, I'm angry because the Christian religion and Christian community messed up my mind, saith the Lord. You imagine Jesus saying that, I'm mad at the Christian community for messing up my mind. No, Jesus is not thinking anything messed up his mind because he's the way, the truth, and the life. Or, let's take even something more basic, you know, let's all practice this together. I am gay, saith the Lord. I am heterosexual, saith the Lord. <laughs> I am bisexual, saith the Lord. I never read any of those things in the red letters. <laughs> How about this one? I am the way, the truth, and the life, saith the Lord. Ooh, you see? See how that resonates? You feel that? You feel the, the I am-ness in there? Before Abraham was, I am. I am, saith the Lord. You feel that? Rum. You feel that? That's coming from the I am presence. That's coming from truth. But, when we believe in the ego, we have all these other concepts that we believe we are, and the Lord's not saying any of them. The ego's saying all of them. So, he says, what can be expected from insane premises except an insane conclusion? 
The way to undo an insane conclusion is to consider the sanity of the premises on which it rests. Now here it is. I love how Jesus flips it around. Now he's going to give us the punchline. You cannot be in italics attacked. Wow. Show me that one. If that's the truth, you cannot be in italics attacked. Number two, attack has in italics no justification. And three, you are in italics responsible for what you believe. So Jesus has given it to us straight. Number one, you cannot be attacked. Number two, attack has no justification. And number three, you are responsible for what you believe. Now, I know some of you, I'll take a little sip here. I know some of you are, are looking at those last three and you're saying, okay, Jesus, you're telling me this is true, this is true, this is true. You cannot be attacked, attack has no justification, and you are, are responsible for what you believe. Let's take them one, two, three. You cannot be attacked. If you look through a darkened glass and you look at the perception of this world, clearly bodies can attack and be attacked, right? That's, that's part of the, the perception of the world. We're, we're talking about human bodies, plant bodies, animal bodies, you know, bodies, bodies, bodies. Bodies can seem to be attacked, but he's telling us, you cannot be attacked. So what, who's he talking to? Is he talking to your personality? No. As always, he's talking to the mind. He's saying, you, your mind. Hey, you, dreamer of the dream. <laughs> you, dreamer of the dream, cannot be attacked. He's, he's talking right to the, to the you that needs to hear this. He's not talking to the personality self. He's saying, you, cannot be attacked. The ego, of course, believes in attack, but if you identify with the ego, that's where the problem starts. Because why? The ego is not the Christ. If you believe in the ego, then you believe in attack. Christ doesn't have sponsor the idea of attack. God certainly doesn't sponsor the idea of attack. But the ego is the belief that you can separate from God, and that's why it is an attack thought. And as long as you identify with the ego, you identify with the dream figure. You identify with the body. I even heard one spiritual teacher recently saying, um, he was being interviewed, and, and the questioner said, um, said, uh, you, do you have an ego? <laughs> that's the question was, and the, and the man said, um, well, of course, because I have a body. He was equating the ego with the body. Jesus seemed to have a body, but he didn't have an ego. You see, that's not a really good analogy to say, if you've got a body, you've got an ego. Because Jesus, as he transcended the ego in his mind, he still seemed to have a body. It was a perfect demonstration of healing and miracles and happiness and joy and peace and calm. Jesus seemed to, the Spirit used the body in an egoless way. So don't even give me this excuse, if you've got a body, you've got an ego. No, wrong. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you have a body or not. It's the main question is in your mind. Are you attached? Do you believe that you're an ego or do you believe that you're the Christ? That's what counts. Don't, you don't have to ask me, why did Ramana Maharshi die of cancer? What kind of question is that? The only meaningful question is whether you, have an ego, whether you believe in the ego or not. Now that's a question, <laughs> but don't ask me these questions about these dream figures, you know? Was Mary Baker Eddy enlightened? Ba 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 Dream figures don't wake up. Dream figures don't get enlightened. Dream figures are projections that block the awareness of divine mind. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. You see, we're going to slice through all these delay maneuvers of the ego and let's zoom right in. You cannot be attacked. He's saying, you, dreamer of the dream, 
cannot be attacked. Why? There's only one. Who's going to attack one? There's no attacker or attackee. You have to have two to have attack. And that's what the ego is trying to fool us, fool the mind with, with these perceptions. Okay, the first one, you cannot be attacked. Second one, attack has no justification. Why does attack have no justification? Well, if, if so, it's one thing to believe in the ego, but don't go trying to make up a world to prove it. It's like, so you seem to believe in the ego. Jesus and the Holy Spirit is like, well, we're fine with fake. It's like Jesus and the Holy Spirit are saying, well, the ego is fake news. The ego is fake news. And we're, we're, we're great with that. It's just like, but don't project a world out and make up a bunch of stories to try to convince yourself that it's true. In fact, from Hawaii, I, I was, I think it was Tim, uh, Tim Reagan. Oh my gosh, Tim, what a beautiful, what a beautiful expression you wrote. Yeah, I think it's here. Wow, there's so many questions. <laughs> I know you're in here, Tim. I know you're in here. Probably at the beginning. It's the last one. Oh, it's on the back. <laughs> Tim. Tim Reagan. So Tim was talking about forgiveness and was basically saying that as long as you when you are seemingly participating in this world, your goal is either to make real or to not make it real. That is your choice. How beautiful. Because what Tim was saying in here is that it's the purpose you hold in your mind that you have to watch. Like they were sharing this last night. They were sharing, Kenneth and, and Andy were sharing, it's like the purpose. You have to get really clear of your purpose. It's not so much, you can't really judge this thing versus that thing in the world. That's what the ego is trying to do. This is spiritual, it's more spiritual to do this than that. It's more spiritual to have this ritual and this practice than that. It's, it's the purpose in the mind that determines the helpfulness or the harmfulness. The right mind is helpful, the wrong mind is not helpful. It's a split mind that's the problem. And that split mind makes up a split dream. A dream that you dream in secret, and a dream that you gave away. Ah, that's the whole problem. But you don't resolve it by trying to, to change something in form. You have to change your mind about your mind. You ha what does that mean? You have, to, you have to change the purpose from one of hatred, which is the ego's purpose for the world, to one of forgiveness and happiness and peace and joy, which is the Holy Spirit's purpose for the world. The Holy Spirit and the ego never meet. Because if you brought light and darkness together, guess what? Pew! Darkness is gone, automatically. You bring your dark thoughts to the light, pew! they're gone. You turn a light on in your bedroom, it's not like you go to your bedroom, you turn a light on and then you watch the battle to see who's going to win, the darkness or the light. Flip the switch, there they go, dun, 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 titanic battle, who's going to win, the light or the darkness? No, no, when you turn that light switch on, what happens? Light. Unless you've got a bad electrical circuit there. But for this metaphor, please. You turn that light on and light. You don't anticipate a battle, bum, bum, bum. God and the devil are going to fight it out in my bedroom. Is it going to be the light or the darkness? No, no. And, and that's what this is saying. If you get clear of your purpose, if you're clear of your purpose, that's it. That's how you don't make the error real. But what happens if you are in your wrong mind? What happens if you're in your ego state of mind? You're going to look at the projection and you're going to make up a story. You're not going to see the world simultaneous. Oh no. Well, did you see the way he looked at me? And I sent him three emails and he did not even respond. 
And did you see that smirky smile on her face? And well, or we could talk about the stories of the world, like like um, Jason was doing. You know, I my mother was bulimic; she was alcoholic. My father was workaholic; he he was in denial. You know, it, it doesn't matter. Any story that we look to, why do we use stories? Why do we keep telling these stories? Why do why do people go to psychotherapists and sit there for days or months or years or decades telling stories? Of, and then I had this memory when I was three years old. And I was just outside playing, having fun in the backyard. And it started to rain and my clothes got wet and I got all muddy and I came running into the house and my mom grabbed me and said, How dare you bring mud into this house? And she stripped it off, stripped my clothes off, and I was naked. And and then I was shivering in the cold, only three years old, and she runs with the clothes to put the clothes in the washing machine. <laughs> and she leaves me shivering at the door, shivering and cold while she washes the clothes. And then she comes back an hour later as I'm just standing there shivering. It's a story. The ego makes up stories. It's not real, it's a fabrication. It's a projection of guilt and pain and shame and hurt. It's a motion picture of guilt. The ego made it all up. So what Jesus is saying is this. When you get angry, which we've discussed, the anger was coming up, it's okay. Jesus is like, I'm fine with fake. You know, Holy Spirit and I were fine with fake. It's, it's no problem. You know, don't, don't feel, when that anger comes up, it's okay. But just don't justify it. Don't project it onto the world and make up a story to convince yourself that you have a good reason and a good right to be angry. Because guess what? You don't. Jesus is telling us anger is never justified. When people read that line in the Course, sometimes people freak. What? Jesus is saying anger is never justified. He's not saying you won't get angry. He knows you're going to get angry. He knows you're going to get good and angry a lot. And maybe it's not doesn't feel so good, but at least it's coming up into awareness. But then he's saying, now come join with me in mind training and don't justify it. When you're tempted to blame your parents, when you're tempted to blame the society, the politicians, the neighbor, when you're tempted to blame the weather, when you're tempted to blame anything of time and space, bring it to me, bring it to the Holy Spirit, and go, okay, all right, I'm feeling angry here. I'm, I'm tempted to make a story up. I'm tempted to make up a false cause-effect story. Remember, there's no causes and effects in the world. It's just all spurious. It's all make-believe. I'm tempted to make up a story why I'm angry. And Jesus is saying, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't justify it. Because those crazy thoughts going through your consciousness, you're trying to justify them. Those are all private thoughts. You've got a lot of private thoughts, a lot of secrecy going on in your mind. It's a dark mind. That's okay. He's fine with it. He's saying, good, good, good. Glad you're noticing. <laughs> Glad you're noticing your mind now, <laughs> instead of focusing so much on the images. Glad you're paying attention to those emotions. Glad you're feeling those feelings. Glad you're aware of those thoughts. But don't justify those thoughts. Because you just want to be right about the ego. If you want to hold on to those egoic thoughts and project it out to the world all the time and keep blaming the world, you're falling right into the ego's trap, because that's why the ego made the world. It made the world to draw a bunch of false witnesses, false body witnesses, good bodies, bad bodies, evil bodies. Oh, we got all the precious sweet bodies. Oh, David, he's, sometimes he's such a sweet body. And Mother Teresa was a sweet body. Gandhi was a sweet body. Buddha was a sweet body. Jesus. There we are. Hitler. Ah. Oh evil body. Oh, we've got Mussolini. Oh, evil body. Oh, wicked witch of the West. Oh, she was an evil body. 
come on, let's, let's face this hatred and this anger right in the mind where it is and quit projecting it off onto the villains and the tyrants and quit making idols of people. I don't want you to make an idol of David. Jesus didn't want you to make an idol of Jesus, you know. Look at the idols that have been made of Jesus over the past 2,000 years. Some people are, I adore Jesus, I adore you, I praise you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then there's some people who hate Jesus. They hate Jesus. And even the mention of the word, they cringe. Ah, yipes. But let's not make a, a positive idol out of anybody or a negative idol out of anybody. Let's not make a positive or a negative out of anything in time and space. It's all neutral to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows it's just unreal effects from an unreal cause. Let's not give meaning, do out, let's not project a split in the mind to the world. Imagine this for a second. If you're in heaven and you're an idea in the mind of God, everything is love, everything is perfect oneness. But to believe in the ego and the Holy Spirit, or to believe in fear and love, that's the definition of a split mind. A split mind is what we call in psychology schizo schizophrenia. If your mind is split, you've got schizophrenia. So, the first thing you have to do, like in 12 steps, I want to see you all raise your hands. Who is experiencing themselves as schizophrenic? There we go, yeah. It's, yeah there we go. I see those hands going up. So now we know what we're dealing with. Philippe, with your cat, you were asking me, how are we going to do this? Here's the first admission. You know, in 12 steps, you've got to admit that you have a problem. You have to admit that you have an issue with the alcoholism or the drugs or the, the sex or whatever. You have to have first an admission of schizophrenia. Because how are you going to heal it if you think, oh, I'm fine, fine. Oh, take the good with the bad. What do you think? God creates bad and good? What kind of God? <laughs> Why would you want to spend eternity with a God who creates good and bad? Who creates past and future? Who creates male and female? Who creates, you know, morning and night? Why, good and evil. Why would we want to believe that God would be the creator of good and evil? Only glory, only love comes from, from the real God. You can't believe in this anthropomorphic God. So, Instead of like, try, maybe you're not aware of the split, maybe you just say, okay, I have a hint that I'm schizophrenic, but you're not quite fully aware that in your mind there's a tension going on from trying to hold on to both love and fear, from trying to hold on to two irreconcilable thought systems, one thought system of pure love and one thought system of pure fear. And when you're trying to hold on to both, it gets to be so intense in a mind that's used to oneness, it's all it's used to, one mind. It's not used to these two things in one mind, that it projects the split. And then, that's the trick. That's the dream that you gave away. That's the one where you think it's done to you. These characters are only acting out what's going on in the mind. If some of you think that there's some good in the world and some bad, I would recommend you read Lesson 152 in the workbook of A Course in Miracles, The Power of Decision is My Own. I'll just give you a little glimpse. The Power of Decision. I'm going to go to our little app here, and I'm going to Type in 152 on my ACIM Now app. 152. And then I hit search. And then, oh, there it is. Lesson 152, the power of decision is my own. What's Jesus got to say? He said, I'm doing it to myself. Does he really mean that? The power of decision is my own. No one can suffer loss unless it be his own decision. No one suffers pain except his choice elects this state for him. No one can grieve, nor fear, nor think him sick unless these are the outcomes that he wants. And no one dies without his own consent. 
Nothing occurs but represents your wish and nothing is omitted that you choose. Here is your world. You could say, here is your cosmos, complete in all details. Here is its whole reality for you and it is only here salvation is. So, oh, I love it when Jesus goes quantum. He is like, that is the most quantum paragraph in the history of the universe. He's like saying it's all connected and don't for one instant think you can blame something outside of yourself because there's nothing outside of you. You're the Holy Christ. You're created by God and nothing happens to you by accident. Nothing happens to you by chance. Nothing happens against you, against your own wish. So why not be aware of your unconscious beliefs and wishes because until you raise that unconscious up, you're just going to keep doing it to yourself and then the ego is going to go, poor, poor, separated child of God. Oh, poor baby. Look what's happened to you in the world. Look what, look what the world did to you now. Another bad day because you were abused or misused by the world. Jesus is going, that's not it. And then here he comes. You may believe that this position is extreme and too inclusive to be true. Yet, can truth have exceptions? If you have the gift of everything, can loss be, be real? Can pain be part of peace? Or grief of joy? Can fear and sickness enter in a mind where love and perfect holiness abide? The truth must be all-inclusive, if it be the truth at all. Accept no opposites, no duality, and no exceptions. For to do so is to contradict the truth entirely. Now there it is. I, I was talking to Philippe and I was telling him, you really have to give it over to spirit. You know, really give it to spirit. I mean, honestly, like, like just say, I'm schizophrenic, I need help. <laughs> I'm not only schizophrenic, I got a, a, a pretty severe case of psychosis too. Uh, because psychosis is a, is a break from reality. Schizophrenia is hearing multiple voices. We know how that is in the voices of the world. Every day we talk to them <laughs> and they answer us. <laughs> There's a lot of voices going on in our mind. That's schizophrenic. That's a split mind. And psychosis is a, is a, blake, a break from reality. Well, if reality is spirit and I'm seeing a projected world of fragmentation, guess what? This projected world of fragmentation is psychosis. So now I need help in my mind. I need, I need more than psychiatric help. <laughs> I, need, I need more than psychological help. I need the way, the truth, and the life to help me out of what predicament that I seem to be in with this fragmented perception. And he's basically saying that you can do this, but you can't make any exceptions. So there's only two guidelines in the workbook of A Course in Miracles. It's like try to practice the lesson as best as you can. And number two, try not to make any exceptions. That's what a temptation is, is just to try to make an exceptions to divine truth. Making an exception to forgiveness. Saying, oh, I forgive this and this and this and this, but... <laughs> Where's that big finger coming in? But, do you know the tone of voice that they just said on the phone to me? Ah, you know, there comes the rage again. Don't make any exceptions. As best you can, practice this. Try to do this. And also I want to just share that there's nothing special about our community. Our community is no different than anything else in time and space, but it's the purpose in the mind where the healing occurs. It, even spiritual community, if you let the ego get a hold of the spiritual community, it will give you a nightmare. <laughs> it, will, it will give you a nightmare. You'll be sitting up in your bed at night going, what the hell did I get myself into? Because of the purpose. If, you, if you're looking for errors, if you're looking to justify your feelings, if you're looking to project, if you're looking to blame, spiritual community will be the worst nightmare <laughs> that you ever could imagine because of the desire to project. You know, the characters only act out the wishes of the mind. So if 
your wish is to project the blame, then you will receive witnesses of that. And if your wish is to heal, oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's euphoric, it's, 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 a, it's a blissful experience. There was another, uh, I think it was um, toward the end, let's see, the very end. It was the last question, I think, to come in. It was from Carl, Carl Ridding in Massachusetts, and uh, it was beautiful. Carl, are you there, Carl? Carl, we have, and it says, Andy and Kenneth, thank you for leading us into a beautiful retreat last evening. I am finding a lot of feelings coming up around anger. Anger isn't something that I have identified with most of my life. I am familiar with sadness for most of my life. I can remember times where I would hear myself apologizing to God over and over whenever I was dealing with someone who was angry. I believe I somehow internalized that another person being angry was my fault and I would apologize to God. This left me with a lifelong pattern of feeling like I am not living up to God's call for me. Last evening I felt this overwhelming feeling that I am messing up by not joining in community living and being wholly focused on my relationship with God. Maybe if I did that I could fix this ongoing feeling I have a failure, in, I've been a failure in the face of God. I had a horrible time staying awake for last night's session and then I couldn't get the video to work this morning. Maybe that's why we're... There's, there's Carl, it's Carl. You got, you got something going. Carrie. Carrie. Oh, okay. <laughs> I won't start over. Carrie. <laughs> Carl, Carrie, you know, to the Holy Spirit, you know, it's really all the same. Uh, but uh, at this, I was able to do an expression session with my wife. Oh, maybe I thought that's why you were, maybe, maybe okay, your wife, Carrie and, and the wife. And it helped because for the very first time I could say to her, it makes me angry when you get angry. In the past I would always just run around and try to fix whatever the cause was. I was taking responsibility for everyone's emotion around me. So, you're asking first if there's any tips on how to look at anger turned inward as a way to start expressing it. And I think that was addressed a little bit last night um, with Kenneth and Andy in the sense that you have to acknowledge it first before you can start getting in touch with releasing it. And that's sometimes expressing it to a mighty companion or to a beloved one like with your wife, that, that is a first step because it's like it's, it's part of your mind saying, I'm allowing this into my awareness now and underneath it I want to let it go. That's what uh, Andy was saying last night when he was looking around at everybody in the house saying, I hate you all, he wasn't saying it from the anger to point the blame, he was saying, I hate you all and underneath it was, and I really want to let go of this hatred. And, and you're my mighty companions to do this. So I think, Carrie, what I was talking about earlier about those, those three premises, that's, that's the way to really start to go deep inward and start to just go, oh, I'm just perceiving the world based on what I believe. What I believe is what I perceive. If I spot it, I got it. If I spot anger, I must, it must be reflecting my own anger issue in mind. And then have the willingness to start to say, wow, what do I believe underneath this? Do I still believe in a world outside of me that is capable of doing things to me apart from my choice? Because that's what the trick of the ego is. It's got this unconscious dark belief which is, he calls the dream you dream in secret, and then there's the dream that you gave away. That's what projection is, you know. I, oh, it's not me. 
Did you see what they did to me? Did you see how they looked at me? Did you see they ha how they acted to me? The dream character of Carrie could seem to be abused or it could seem to be mistreated. But Jesus is saying, don't go for that because that's just going to end up justifying the anger and the hurt. But come back into your mind and start to say, wow, if I'm doing this to myself, I must still have some false premises in my unconscious mind that are not lined up with truth. And that's where I need to look. I need to go with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and just say, come on, let's go inside here and let's take a look at this. Last night they mentioned that I, uh, I watched a lot of movies because you, can, you practice with your relationships and then also you practice with, if you have emotions coming up during a song you hear on the radio that brings back memories from the past. Or maybe you're watching a movie and you feel these emotions stirring. I would go let Jesus take me to the movie theater. He would tell me which movie to watch or which movie to rent from back in the day, blockbuster video. I know it's all digital now, but back in the day we had VCRs and VHS and all those things. I would go rent the vi video. Jesus would watch it with me. I would get all stirred up, sometimes very disturbed, very angry. Why did you give me this movie? That's terrible. No, the movie's not terrible, David. It's your mind. <laughs> your mind is, is believing in the ego. That's the terrible thing. Here, let's go. So I would process in the movie theater, in the car, at home. I would process with Jesus. Please help me get underneath this because I don't like how I feel. At least I can decide I don't like these feelings, these intense feelings. But please help me get at the conditions that are underneath these feelings. And then that's how I did it. I did a lot with mu movies, music, relationships. That, that was my, my grounds for, for doing all this healing. And then once I got clear, then I, I started to do these 12-step sheets that are in a couple of my books called Instrument for Peace. Then I put levels of mind diagrams in there to explain how the mind's working and how this all fits together. And then Jesus would give me downloads and then he said, oh, let's make an app. So we have, have a Spiri app now uh, that is an app that works with iOS and we're working on it for Androids. Uh, or you can go online, you can go to Facebook and if you're Spanish, you can do the Spanish of <laughs> Spiri uh, spiritual assistant, it, it all is about going back in the mind and tracing it inward, tracing the upset to the underlying beliefs and thoughts. Because it's always the beliefs and thoughts that are generating the upset. Nothing happening on the world is generating anything. The world's a projection, the world's a distractive device, the world's a, it's a way to try to, to justify the feelings. Don't look in the darkened glass, Jesus is saying. No, don't, don't look to the world. Come inside to me. I'll help you. I'll help you go inside and find the peace. But don't look to the world. It's just going to be tempting to blame people, places, things, and circumstances. If you keep looking to the world of images, you're falling right into the ego's trap. So I'm glad, Carrie, that you, you brought that up because basically that's the point of this whole session is to start to deal with that anger. And even if you seem to have internalized it as, as part of Carrie's persona, um, it's the same error. It doesn't matter whether we look out and we see tyrants and dictators and uh, you know evil people, or whether we seem to be one who internalizes it and feels guilty and shameful, like, oh, I am a guilty, shameful person because I'm not serving God's plan. Um, you know, that's what you're describing is that's kind of the error. But Jesus is saying, well, either way, you know, you project it out onto other characters, you project it out onto that dream figure, you could project it onto a grasshopper. Uh, you know, you could feel, you could make a, a children's book, the grasshopper who, the evil grasshopper who ruled the world. You could project all the evil of the world onto a grasshopper if you wanted to. Jesus is like, that's all right. We're fine with fake. You, you, know, you have many versions of fake. It's all right. We, you get upset, 
no problem. You get angry, though it's not a black mark on your soul, you know, it's just an error to be corrected. And better, I will help you. Let's go right down to the core of it and free your mind forever from, from this, these crazy uh, assumptions. Okay, well, that's all my spiel for today. Now let's have some interactivity going here. Anybody have anything coming up? Any questions? Any curiosities? Any, uh, any insights that you've seen that, that helps you leap closer to the dreamer of the dream in your mind? Your uh, lucid dreaming experience? Like, wow! I am not at the mercy of this world of time and space at all. That's, that's what this whole session has been about, is to help take you one more giant leap step closer to that invulnerable state in your mind. That state of mind that just laughs at the ego belief. It does a, a huge belly laugh at the idea of separation. That's, that's what the dreamer state is really about. So, Eric, You've got a nice uh, studio view of everything. Do we have any uh, hands up for...? Yes, I saw Adriano just raised his hand, so... Hey, Go Adriano! Ahead, hey! Hi, David! Hey! <laughs> yeah, um, actually I have a lot of to say, but... Uh, we don't have uh, too much time, and uh, there are other people they want to, uh, they want to, uh, say. But um, I can say that, uh, for example, uh, when you said about this schizophrenia uh, between the ego and the um, the real self, yeah? and distinction. That's normal distinction that I feel my, my myself all the time. And this eager, 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 a lot of boot, um, a lot of uh, anger, a lot of anger. And uh, I learned that um, because in the past I tried to fix up this thing, and uh, I had no idea. I, I got this insight. Oh, okay, that's a part of me that try, or that that's a part of the, this e ego that tried to to fix up the thing up. And uh, I'm learning uh, more and more. Um, to give it up uh, to Jesus, to the Spirit, to create this uh, uh, relationship with uh, Christus, with Jesus. Uh, I said to you that uh, I I go to the to the church and I belong uh, to a church, and for me it's a kind of to create this. Uh, uh, relationship with uh, Jesus because uh, that was uh, uh, to belong to, to a church uh, that was in, in for my ego I want I want do this thing in this life because I'm horrified I have horror about this to to belong to organization some kind of organization, but uh, at the same time, I see that I have to create this relationship and to forgive. Maybe Jesus, maybe the church, maybe something else. Yeah? For example, this word repentance. Yeah? I repent my sins and all in the past. Oh God. Uh, this word for me was the uh, it's a lot of pain. And now I try to okay when I hear the word repentance for me it's the same as uh, forgive. 
I forgive. I, I, I bring back to my mind and I give to the spirit, to the light. Mm -hmm. and, um, and sometimes or the, often I, I see that, oh God, I see the, this resist, resistance because I don't want to give up this life. I don't want to give up this role as Israel. Well. Or, or this cozy life. Oh, I'm okay with my life. I don't need to. It is very difficult because at the same time, I have this uh, a desire to go uh, to the love, but at the same time, I don't want to lose my my life that my egos uh, did it. Uh, and, uh, I see often this uh, uh, conflict, yeah? Yeah. but now I learn to okay, I can do this alone and just give to the spirit. That's my big insight. Yeah. Last time, um, beautiful, Adriano. Beautiful. That's it. You're just you're showing it in action. You're just taking those baby steps, and of course. When we become attached to this world, we, we say, well, I've just got a, a, a cozy little life here and, um, and I want to be happy, but, but there's the, the ego part is quite attached to that cozy little world. And, and that's okay. Like Jesus is like, yeah, I understand that. He said, I know, I've been through that myself. <laughs> I, I went through the same thing. I, I had to really trust the Spirit and take my baby steps and, and have faith and keep, keep the faith and keep praying and keep asking. And so it's great, you're just showing, that's exactly what Jesus went through, that's exactly what I went through, and you're saying, I'm going through it. And, and even to reinterpret repent, which had a very hard meaning before, now to forgive, you're, you're, uh, it's working. So thank you. You're a great witness for us, and it's always a joy to see you on the online retreat. Your smile and, and your presence is, uh, is, a, is a beautiful gift for the whole world. Thank you, Adriana. Okay, I see that Nikki has raised her hand. Hi. Hi. Hi, Nikki. How's everybody? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, thank you, David, and thank you, Living Miracles, for offering this because this retreat is amazing, and uh, it's very. I love what you're saying. It's very validating. It helps me to know that I am following my spirit and a lot of the things that I'm doing. I'm on the right track because when I hear you say it, I'm like, okay, you know. But I do have one question: preferences. Are they, are they inherently wrong or is it just the desperation and the attachment that's connected to them? Okay, good one. Oh, that's good. That's great, Nikki. I'm glad you're asking this. That actually came to me as part of the download this morning. Jesus was saying we would talk about this. Well, Preferences are judgments and, and they are all made up by the ego because the, the very first um, principle of the 50 miracle principles is there's no order of difficulty in miracles. And then later he tells us why. He says it's because there's no hierarchy of illusions. So, so the world is all, the whole cosmos is equally illusory. But the key thing you're really asking is like, okay, it, you know, is, is there something helpful? Can there be something helpful, uh, a helpful way of looking at the preferences? And Jesus is like, yes, there is. Even though the ego made them up, Jesus and the Holy Spirit have got a, uh, they're in charge of the unwinding from them. So like last night, Andy was talking about, you know, preferences, for, they were talking about food preferences. First, Kenneth talking about the, you know the fish sticks, and then and Andy, you know I'm going to eat as little as possible, and I'm just going to eat no more Snickers, and you know and this, you know he was starting to touch on the preference question uh, pretty soon, 
And, and yet what Jesus is saying is, listen, that's all part of your self-concept because Christ has no preferences. Christ is just pure love and God is pure love, so there aren't any preferences in heaven. But even though the ego made them up, he says, put them under my control. So he's saying, you have sexual preferences, let me guide them. You have food preferences, great, give them to me. You have climate preferences, all great, give them to me. Uh, you have preferences of music, great, give them to me. And what happens is that because Jesus and the Holy Spirit know the preference system, we'll say, for example, just the preference system of Nikki. It's just really just an example because really it's just the ego, but then Jesus and the Holy Spirit know the perfect way to unwind you or undo Nikki uh, in, in a way that's going to work, in a way that's going to end you up as, oh, I'm the Christ. <laughs> wow, thank you. <laughs> that's important. <laughs> that's that's a, a very important recognition. But uh, this morning I was on the internet and I was typing in A Course in Miracles and I was looking at some of the websites and one of the websites, what I think it was called undoingjoey.com, <laughs> came up under A Course in Miracles. And I laughed and I said, cool! And then it, it talked about, the, this is a website for starting to realize that, that Joey can disappear <laughs> and who I am can, can reappear. And I said, oh cool, that's to make a, a website. Imagine if we did that. I'm going to have to talk to my staff, undoingdavidhoffmeister.com. I think that domain name is still available. <laughs> you see, this is where the Holy Spirit takes the preferences. And in my life, you know, I like music, so Jesus gave me a lot of music in the script. I like movies. Jesus said, oh yeah, I can, I can use your, your love of movies. All your relationship preferences, oh, I'll use those. Your sexual preferences, I'll use those. Your climate preferences, I'll use those. But he, Spirit brings them in such a way that it's like, it's like they come to you without you personally doing anything to get them. Like, like you may have preferences for a certain kind of food or so forth, and then you, you work a job, you get money, and then you go out and you buy things and spend things and consume things that fulfill those preferences. Jesus is like, well, you can do it that way you want, but how about you practice forgiveness, let's have some fun with this forgiveness adventure, and then while you're doing it, I'm going to send in some preferences that you like, because I know you like them and I'm going to satisfy you in that way, not because of your own personal effort, but just because you're devoting yourself to awakening. That's what happened with the scribe of the Course, Helen Schuckman. She had a preference for green pantyhose, he got her those green pantyhose. She had a preference for a certain kind of Borgana coat in New York City. She would only pay so much for it, had to be used. He delivered that exact coat to her in a way that would save time so she could get back to scribing the course. You see, the, the, the forgiveness, the greater plan is always the most important thing. But the good news is, this is what I think you're really asking is, is are these preferences always ego, and can they be used in a helpful way? Yes, they're always ego, and they can and are used by the Spirit in the most glorious way to give you a, a quite an interesting, happy adventure until they disappear completely and you, you're the dreamer of the dream. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'm glad uh, I felt Jesus was telling me that that would come up, and then you came right in there, slipped it in there just at, at the wire. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, since we're doing Dreamer of the Dream, even though it's 11.59, let's do one more bonus interaction, just for the fun of it, because we don't believe in time. And if anybody's got their hand up, Eric, let's, let's throw a, a happy bonus interaction. Then you can have a, a nice rest before we get into our movie for the day. Okay, great. Yeah, we've got quite a few hands up, but we'll go for our bonus to Monica. Go ahead, Monica. 
Hi, hi everybody. Hi David. I love hi, you. I'm so excited to be here <laughs> with you. You know, you are you are my teacher and you helped me tremendously. Uh, this summer I started listening to a lot of your, you know, talks and they are be, they've been very helpful to understand the the course you know I, I started uh, studying a course in 2018 but my husband started it in 2010 and I've been you know exposed to it and we were talking and everything I have so many things to tell you but I don't want to you know make it too long um, to, to see something that um, you know it will help carry and probably everybody uh, you said David that um, we need to trace the upset to the underlining belief and thought and I had an experience like that, like that. one night, uh, my daughter, she's a teenager, 16 years old. She's uh, probably my greatest teacher in A Course in Miracles because <laughs> I practice it with her a lot. <laughs> she brings up a lot of anger for me, talking about anger. And this particular night, she wouldn't uh, want to uh, do something that I asked her to do, to read something in uh, Romanian, you know? A short paragraph she absolutely refused and I was I became so angry you know I was thinking in my mind I do so many things for you you know and you are not even doing this for me you know so and my husband is very good at reminding me Monica this is for you you know well <laughs> think about why you got so angry because sometimes I forget you know I get so tangled into egos you know script I forget what this is about and I make it real. And I think this is our problem here. We believe that the dream is real. And I think this is what we need to undo with the course, the help of A Course in Miracles. The course helps us to undo the belief that the dream is real. That's why we get so angry because we believe it's real, you know? <laughs> yeah. Which in, uh, in fact is not. So, you know, I uh, questioned myself, you know, I, I went deep inside the mind, like you said, David. I question why, why do I get so angry, you know, and I realized that because I got the no, I felt rejected. For me, getting an all, no meant being rejected and being, you know, without love. And in that moment, when I realized that, I felt such a wave of, you know, of something coming up. I started shaking and 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 crying, you know, uh, having that feeling of you know abandonment and being without the love. It felt so terrible. And then after that pass, you know, I calmed down and I was thinking, you know, the course says I'm Christ, I'm the Son of God. So it's impossible to be without the love. I am love. How could I believe this? You know? And in that moment, I felt so much joy, you know, when I realized this is a lie. I, I don't have to believe this lie anymore, you know? And the other day at the store, David, I'm so, I know you're, you're fired up about, uh, and I'm fired up too about synchronicity. <laughs> you know and witnesses to God's love you know I was at goodwill I I had you know an impulse to go there even though I didn't plan to but you know my husband asked me to find the movie for him and I was thinking oh maybe I'm going to find that movie so I go there and that day I was practicing lesson 124 you know to listen for God's voice and at some point so I'm really aware of what's going on around me because I know the Holy Spirit talks to me through everything and especially because I love to read through books you know but it comes my messages comes from everywhere and I pay attention to the song lyrics even though you know my you know English is not my first language I have trouble understanding you know sometimes many times the lyrics of a song because I cannot hear the, the words clearly but I started paying attention to the song at, at some point you know it started like um, I love you. I love you. I love. I've never heard a song, you know, where I love you is repeated. It was like twenty times, maybe. It kept repeating. I love you. I love you. I love you. You know, and I was so. It was that day. I felt like I was. Dream, I was living the happy dream, David. Everything went so smooth. Everything was beautiful. It was a beautiful spring day. There were so many, you know, symbols of God's love, and I, I you know. So now whenever I do that lesson, I 
I keep, you know, that lesson says, listen for God's voice. You know, I hear that. I love you. I love you. You are my son, holy son. I, I find pleasure in you. You are my joy. This is what I keep hearing now. You know, I love you. I love you. Um, <laughs> you know, a few years ago when we visited Israel, I was praying for something. I was praying to meet a certain person. And unbeknownst to me, he was in our group, you know, traveling. He was in that group with me and I wasn't aware of it, you know, a priest, a monk. And, um, and then when I found out he was the one that I wanted to meet, you know, I was so excited. And they became aware of this prayer. God, please make me aware that I already got what I'm praying for. And then later on, I found out from you and you're reading the course, this is a great prayer, you know, to pray. Just is, you know, so you have a question, the answer is there with the question. And in the courses, you know, these problems that we have are, are reflections of the fact that we believe we separated from God. So there is only one problem and one answer, right? The answer is accepting the, the correction. And um, so, um, yeah, I, I, there's so many things. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so that's the, the idea. If you ask, it will be given. It will be given to you. Yes, and they, regarding to this topic, I, you know, I was wondering, how is not this not real? Because my body feels so real, you know? I was wondering, how can it? Be real because I feel pain, you know, when it hurts, like a root canal. I had a root canal and it hurt like, you know, very badly. And one night I had a dream, you know. Hey, Monica, I, yes. I just want to check if you had a question since we just have a, a couple minutes left. Did you, ha did you have a quick a question? I just wanted to share about this, you know, and I think it's really important to, to uh, it, it supports this topic that, um, so I had this dream, I woke up in pain, you know, I couldn't understand how this is real because I felt pain in the dream. I woke up because I felt pain and I felt, I, I, I dreamt that an animal attached to my hand and I woke up and I said, oh God, thanks God, it's not real, I said. But then I, I thought, how did I feel the pain? Because there is nothing on my hand. And David, like you said, we don't feel it in our body. So that was a great lesson from the Holy Spirit. It showed me. It showed me that the pain is not in the body, it's in the mind. So that's why I wanted, you know, to say that, that for Philippe, because he was asking, how can you, so by asking you, the Holy Spirit will give you the experience. You, you know, you'll get the teaching somehow. Yeah. Beautiful. When it was through that movie, mm -hmm. through the dream, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Monica. You know, you're a great witness that if, if you've started the course in 2018 and you are on fire like this, two years later, then that's just a good witness for everybody that, that if you just give yourself over to it, the, the experiences come so strong and they're so convincing. And I'm glad you, you brought up, uh, again, the symbols because right before I started today, I was playing a song for everybody here in the studio, but I, I think I could, uh, I could play it for... Uh, for everybody. Um, let's see if I still have it here. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you this. Maybe you can do it, you can all do it as a homework assignment. But when I started shining and sharing with the Course and speaking, letting the, Jesus and the Holy Spirit speak through me uh, decades ago, as I would travel around, Jesus would send me musicians. You heard Svava. Uh, Eric, our MC, is, is a, just a channel, has all this amazing music that's come through him. And there's been the Helena Hunasons and the, the um, Donna Marie Carey's and many, many um, singer-songwriters that I have collaborated with that are kind of a musical pathway to... God and to heaven. And so many years ago, I, I had a friend back in the 1990s, her name is Resta, and she would come over and she would walk in a nearby 
cemetery and she would listen back in the days of cassettes. Uh, back in the 1990s, she would listen to my uh, cassette recordings while she was meditating and walking through the cemetery. And suddenly, uh, in her mind, it opened up a, a whole channel to the angels. And so, the angels sent through her about 170 songs, uh, give or take some. And, and these songs, some of them were two and three part harmonies. Uh, Linda and Pete sang one of Resta's songs uh, at the beginning of this uh, retreat. And so, if you would like, I will tell you about a website I made years, years ago called musicofchrist.net. And if you go to musicofchrist.net and you go into all these albums that uh, Resta received from the angels, one big album after another, after another, after another, it's a whole pathway back to God just through music. And today when I was preparing to come here to the studio, I went in there and Jesus instructed me to go into album number one and the song is called Streamin' Dreamio. Because our topic is Dreamer of the Dream, back in the 1990s, streaming technology was just coming in. So there was, you know, getting more popular, streaming audio, streaming video. Now it's, it's very popular, digital music, Spotify, all over the world and so forth. But back then, streaming audio and streaming video was the way that we were beginning to receive the songs uh, in, a, in a very efficient way. So these angels made a song called Stream and Dreamio, in which the world we perceive through the five senses is streaming audio. The sounds we hear in this world is the streaming audio. The, the sights that we see in this world of fragmentation is the streaming video. And then Jesus and the angels make a song called Stream and Dreamio, and he calls it a crazy show. This is the problem is we have to trace it back, way back into the mind to the release point, which is forgiveness and the atonement. But the whole song pokes fun at this world as streaming audio and streaming video. And it also tells us we can't organize the script, we can't pick the pieces that we want, we can't, um, we can't fix the Stream and Dreamio issue until we go back inside and we learn to relax and go with the flow of Stream and Dreamio. So, if you have any time between now and the movie and you have a chance, go to musicofchrist.net and then there's a couple musicians pavilions at the bottom, but there's a, a link to all of Resta's songs. And if you go to album one, or it's all indexed too, you can go by alphabetical uh, naming too. Just go down to S if you use the alphabetical index to Stream and Dreamio. And I guarantee you, you will have a smile on your face with this cute song from the angels. In fact, when Resta was receiving this song, she reached a certain line in the song where she was taking it down and she just burst into laughter. She absolutely could not contain the laughter, even though she was just in the middle of taking this song down from the angels. And, um, and I'll tell you, it has something to do with uh, to being stuck in time, like flies in glue. That was when Resta's mind became unglued and she burst into laughter. So when she played the song for me with her guitar, she could not even get through the song when she got to the part that keeps you stuck in time like flies in glue. There's just some little spot, sometimes the angels are so playful and so funny and have such a great perspective on this world that it is, you cannot help but burst into laughter. And that's the whole goal, like Ken and Andy were saying, you know, if at the very end, uh, 
yeah, it was Andres and Melu. You had us all laughing. You had us all laughing there at the very end from your bed. <laughs> we were all laughing at the very end. And we thank you for that because it was showing how even through a topic as serious as anger, you had the humor of the Holy Spirit pouring through and we all laughed together at that. So thank you for the gift. Thank you, Melu. <laughs> I see you there on the screen. Thank you for your, for your joy and your laughter. Okay, well, we will have a very good movie that will relate to everything that we've talked about last night's session and today's session, and it will be a great healing and undoing movie uh, coming up next. So relax, enjoy, have a rest, um, take a nap, uh, whatever you need to do in whatever time zone you are, just uh, make yourself very prepared for a happy, receptive uh, movie that will really burst your heart open towards the dreamer of the dream perspective. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you so much for being here with me. <laughs>